Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's AHRQ web conference on optimizing health data and information visualization. Although a few people are still logging in, we are going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Chenju Jenny Xiao, and I will be moderating this webinar. I currently serve as a health scientist administrator for the health IT division in AHRQ Center for Health Evidence and Practice Improvement. You should now be viewing the slide with the agenda for today's webinar. Please also note that we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be available via the AHRQ Health IT YouTube channel in about two weeks. Copies of the PowerPoint slide were emailed to each of you earlier this morning and were also available for download as you logged in today. We will also be sending the slides to participants via email following the webinar, along with instructions for obtaining continuing education credit. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to remind everyone about why AHRQ sponsored these webinars and how this work is related to AHRQ's mission. As a research agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, AHRQ's mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work within the department and with other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. AHRQ works to accomplish this mission through a diverse body of work carried out by its research portfolios and offices. This work includes investing in research, generating materials, and providing training opportunities, such as this webinar, that can help to foster diffusion of research findings to the agency's key stakeholder groups and to the public. The health IT portfolio at AHRQ has long supported research to improve the quality of healthcare through the use of effective health information technology. Today's presentation will focus on research that is geared toward enhancing how health information is presented and organized so that it is more meaningful to patients and actionable for providers. We are pleased to have two highly esteemed AHRQ-funded researchers with us today. They include Dr. Brian Zygmunt Fisher, an associate professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education, University of Michigan School of Public Health, and a research associate professor in the University of Michigan Department of Internal Medicine, and Dr. Genevieve melton Mao, associate professor of surgery and health informatics core faculty at the University of Minnesota, and the chief health information officer at Fairview Health Services and the University of Minnesota Physician. This webinar event is accredited by Professional Education Services Group. And for those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information about how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of the presentation. It will also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me know that neither AHRQ nor FBF, RTI, PESG, Dr. Zygmunt Fisher, or myself have any financial interest to disclose. Dr. Melton Mo would like to disclose that her spouse works for App Medical. Please note that this conflict was resolved through peer review of the content that will be presented today. Lastly, please note that no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Just a brief note about questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentation to address participant questions. However, during the presentation, feel free to submit questions for the presenters using the Q&A panel located on the right of the PowerPoint slide. As a reminder, Participants are in a listen-only mode, 
So to ask questions, you will need to ask use the Q&A panel. This slide shows the learning objectives for today's webinar. At the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to describe the challenges patients face in understanding medical test data and methods that can be used to help patients make sense of health data, better manage their health, and to make choices about their care. Participants will also be able to describe the findings of research that examines EHR navigator usage and clinical note usability to support improved provider workflow. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter. As noted earlier, Dr. Zygmunt Fischer is currently an Associate Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He received his PhD in Behavioral Decision Theory from Carnegie Mellon University. He uses his interdisciplinary background to research methods of science and health communication, including the determinants of health risk perception, how best to display health risk statistics and test results to make them more intuitively meaningful and effects of poor numeracy on use of health data, and the power of narratives in health communication. Topical interests include vaccination, diabetes, genetic testing, dieting exposure, and cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. And now it is my pleasure to turn the control over to Dr. Zygmunt Fischer. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be able to be here and to uh, tell you a little bit about the work that I and my colleagues have been doing. I need to start by um, apologizing, hopefully, for something that won't come up. I'm getting over a touch of bronchitis, so I'm plied with fluids and cough drops, but if it comes up, just so know that I'll, I'll be back as soon as I stop coughing. Um, I want to start today by telling a story, um, a story that is actually a true story about uh, an episode that happened to me um, over 15 years ago when I went through a serious medical um, issue for a number of years, uh, for an extended period of time, and was actually in a hospital for an extended period of time. And, you know, I'm a medical decision-making person. I'm a relatively engaged patient. And so I was getting blood tests done on an ongoing and regular basis, and I was the kind of patient that looked at the results each day. And one day I saw, when the results came up, that, um, that I was getting a oops, total bilirubin of 1.4 milligrams per deciliter. And I was a little curious about this because that didn't seem to be, to my memory, what the number it was that I had remember seeing. I didn't know a whole lot about Billy Rubin, but I knew that that was different. So <clears throat> when my attending came around, I asked her, I said, hey, what's up with this Billy Rubin number? And what she said to me was, don't worry. I'll tell you when to worry. Now, wait a second. I'm a medical patient. I'm going through a very intensive period of my life where my life may literally be hanging in the balance based upon these test results. You're making them available to me, and the best that we can do is to say to me, don't worry. I'll tell you when to worry. No, I, I don't accept that. That's not enough. If we're going to give people access to test results, we need to be able to help them through this. Because the core problem here is one that's actually a very well-known phenomenon in the marketing literature. It's an idea called information evaluability. There are certain types of information that's easy to evaluate. I know what it means. And there are certain types of information that are hard for me to evaluate. I know what it is but I don't know what it means for me. And the truth is, hard to evaluate data, like in this case, my bilirubin, require meaningful reference standards in order for a user to make sense of it. 
And this isn't just an abstract thing. What we find from the marketing literature and also from the medical decision-making literature is that if you don't provide those kinds of reference standards, that medical data, no matter how accurate it may be, becomes ignored in decision-making unless those comparative data are provided. So this is by no means a hypothetical problem, right? We now live in a world where patient portals, electronic access to medical records is becoming widespread and mandated by government um, requirements. So patients aren't just getting access to these results when they're in the hospital or when they're in the clinic. They're getting direct access to them from home when they don't have someone sitting next to them to potentially explain what those results mean. And when they get them, they might get something that might look like this. I know they might get something like this because I didn't make up this slide. This is a screenshot of my test results from a patient portal from a few years ago, a complete blood count. This is what patients see, nothing more and nothing less. So the question becomes, can patients use this in any way productive to their care, to their self-management? Well, let's start, right? Patients have access to their test results, but the value of that data, whether it's for self-management purposes or for allowing them to ask questions about their provider, comes in its meaning, comes in their recognition of normal results or non-normal results. And that first step there, what I just described to you, recognizing whether a result is within that standard range or outside of that standard, standard range is the first essential step to meaningful use. So, let's go back. What's out of range here? Take a look. I'll give you a little bit of help. Three values are out of range here. Not wildly out of range, but out of range. And so if I wanted to talk to my doctor about them or if I had questions, those might be the ones that I would focus on. But notice that you had to work to try to figure that out. You had to go line by line. And for those of you familiar with the kinds of displays that clinicians often receive, notice also you do not see here any form of flag, an L or an H or other kind of marker to indicate that those values were out of range until I highlighted them. Because at least in many patient portals, those kinds of flags are not included. So how hard is this task? Given a table of test results, how hard is it for patients to figure out whether something is out of range? Well, a few years ago, the pilot to the grant that I'm now working on, we did a study that looked at this. And what we did was we came up with a type 2 diabetes scenario. Imagine you have type 2 diabetes, you're getting regular blood tests, and the, the primary task was whether the patient could determine if the hemoglobin A1C value was outside of the standard range. This was administered to over 1,800 adults age 40 to 70 from a demographically diverse internet panel. And within this, we measured two critical constructs, health literacy, sort of people's ability to understand the terms and the language of health communications, as well as numeracy, people's ability to use and manipulate and understand numbers. What participants received were tables of various test results, complete blood count, hemoglobin A1C, renal panel result, and just as I showed you, the tables included a standard range but not, did not include any form of high or low flag. And this is a screenshot of the kinds of, of, of what at least one set of our participants received. Again, nothing fundamentally different from what I showed you before. I'm going to cut straight to the results here. First thing, this is just the percentage of people who were able to indicate that hemoglobin A1C was out of range. Look at the impact of health literacy and numeracy. I mean, first of all, look at the fact that we're nowhere near 100%, even on the pair of bars over at the right, the subset of participants with the highest literacy and the highest numeracy scores. We're looking at about two-thirds to three-quarters getting it right, which means, of course, one-quarter to one-third are not. 
and the results get worse as you get lower literacy skills and lower numeracy skills to the point where people on the bottom end of the scales for both of those constructs are only getting this right, only identifying that it's out of range about a third of the time. But in this study, we also did one additional thing, which was that we manipulated randomly across different people whether the hemoglobin A1C, which was out of range for everybody, was at 7.1% or 8.4%. And the reason we did this is we wanted to see whether or not people's reactions would be sensitive to that number. Now, they ought to be. Those are fundamentally different numbers, especially if you're someone, as the scenario described, who, as someone with type 2 diabetes, should be aiming for keeping their A1C, say, below 7%. Now, 7.1 is pretty close to that, but 8.4 is not. So we wanted to see whether or not people would react differently. And to do that, I'll give you one particular outcome measure from this study. We looked at their estimated likelihood of calling a doctor in an urgent way, as opposed to waiting to talk about it at their next appointment or something like that. The bars over at the right are the high numerate people in the sample. And you can see, to some degree, they're sensitive to this. And I have no, I mean, these are hypothetical scenarios. There's no right answer for how, whether they should or shouldn't call. But the people who saw an A1C of 7.1 were much less likely to think that they needed to make an urgent action versus the people who had an 8.4%. That's good. That's the sensitivity we would want to see. But if you look over at the left, the less numerate and the less literate patients, that pair of bars over on the left, there's no difference there. They're reacting exactly the same, equal proportion, whether the value is 7.1 versus 8.4, which means they're not actually getting anything from that value. They're just reacting to the fact that there's a value there. So clearly there's a problem here. <clears throat> and that study motivated the project that was funded by HRQ that I'm currently working on. Here's a number of my collaborators who have at one point or another, all been with me here at the University of Michigan, but have now dispersed to a certain degree. Um, and I'm going to walk you through a couple different studies from this project to sort of illustrate not just our findings, but our process, because I think it's the process that's in some sense more important to show how we've been thinking about designing intuitively meaningful displays of test results. So let's start here with tables. All right, this is boiled down to its simplest form, what those tables give you. The name for the test, your result, a standard range, and units. And I want to contrast that with this. This is a number line, right? This is elementary school math. Place the number on a line. It's got the standard range placed here and color coded, and your result clearly shown. But there's one other thing that this number line does that's so subtle most people don't recognize its power, and that is it defines endpoints, right? The sort of natural endpoint of zero is clearly defined there, but a important question that a clinician knows, that a pathologist knows, but that most patients don't know is just how high can this go? I mean, we might argue about where we want to put the endpoint, whether it should be 500 or 600 or 450 or whatever, but it's not 10,000. And that information about just how wide the range of possible values is, is absolutely critical to helping a patient understand whether moving five points or 10 points or 100 points is meaningful or not. And we're gonna come back to this point over and over again. It's not just about knowing your value, it's about knowing how differences between your value and other values might affect your outcomes. That's important. Now, I'm just giving you a sort of simple line. We've color-coded the standard range with green to sort of say green is good, but you could imagine a much more richer display that would involve many other kinds of cues to help people get more information from this type of display. And that might look something like these. All right, so here's two other examples. These we call the block line and the gradient line. They're basically the same idea. It's just that in the block line, we have sort of clearly defined ranges that are labeled low, borderline low, or high, or whatever, versus a gradient line, which does the same thing, but uses a continuous color gradient 
to try to convey the reality that being at 102 versus 98 really isn't that big of a difference. It may or may not be what you want to be, but there's not that much of a difference between those two things. Whereas on the block line, going from 102 to 98 tips you over from being borderline to low. So what we wanted to do in our first study is to explore sort of how using these types of displays rather than the standard tables would change people's reactions to test results. So to do that, we came up with a medication management scenario, situation in which patients viewing online the results of multiple blood tests that have been ordered after a doctor's visit to, make, to check up on this patient as they're on an ongoing chronic medication. Like in our first study, we gave this scenario to over 1,600 adults, here now age 18 plus, from the same kind of diverse internet panel. The design, I'm gonna walk you through this step by step. First thing, we randomized between subjects the different display formats, and you saw the four conditions there. Tables, the simple line, the blocks line, and the gradient line. Within each subject, they saw multiple tests. So specifically, they saw three different tests, a platelet count, an alanine aminotransferase, or ALT test, and a serum creatinine test. These are all tests which are commonly ordered for different kinds of reasons for monitoring the patient's blood, liver, kidney function, et cetera. And for each of those three tests, we gave each subject one, test, one display that showed a, what I'll call a near normal value, value that was outside of the standard range, but not very far outside of the standard range in terms of risk, as well as one that was much more further outside of the standard range for which we might think that there's actually some significant risk associated with that. And so one of the points here is, do patients think of these things as different? They're clinically different, Will patients recognize them as such? So this is what I mean. Here's that near normal result versus an extreme result for the serum creatinine test, as displayed in this particular example in the, using the gradient format. And I want to I want to reiterate here. We we collaborated. There are clinicians who are part of our research team um, in terms of picking some of the marker points for where we put high versus where we put other kinds of, where the color gradient changed, et cetera. Obviously, different people may have different opinions about where those lines should be drawn. This is a proof of concept study. How will people react when given one particular set of contextual information, reference points, to make sense of their test results? So here's the, what I think of as, in some sense, the most critical result from the paper. And it's now out, so those of you who are more interested can always go and get it and look at some of the other results. But we looked at that question of, did people draw a distinction in their perceptions of how bad is this, how urgent is it to respond to this? Did they perceive a difference between the near normal test results and the more extreme test results? We would want that to be yes for everybody. So we want people to perceive some degree of difference. We can argue about how much difference, but we ought to see people seeing some degree of difference between those results. And with the tables, we have a disturbingly large percentage of patients, of people in our studies, saying that they don't see these things as any different. They don't see any difference in perceived urgency between a platelet count of 135 versus 25 and an ALT of 80 versus 360, 2.2 versus 3.4 for creatinine. But when we used our number line displays, those numbers dropped dramatically. Not as much as I would like, but much lower. And there's not a whole lot of difference here between these different formats. You can see going down that the lowest level for each of these tests is with the gradient line, but it's not a really strong difference. My takeaway from this is not so much that we've gotten the perfect line design, but simply that lines are a much more nuanced way of presenting these types of test results. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna move forward and talk to you about some other results that we've been working on and presenting have not yet fully published. Um, so here's the same kind of simple design 
presented for him hemoglobin A1C test result, right? That diabetes self-management scenario that we touched upon for early on. One of the interesting challenges here is if, well, first of all, I want to draw your attention. Look at the endpoints, right? This is a percentage. In theory, percentages go from zero to 100. But hemoglobin A1C does not go from zero to 100. And you might argue with us about whether it should go down to four or three or whatever. It might go to nine or maybe even 12 or higher, but it's not going to be zero and it's not going to be 50. And that's really important to convey to patients. But the point I'm bringing this up is, for most patients, especially those with already been diagnosed with diabetes, the question is, is the standard range actually the relevant reference point that they should be thinking about? Now, if you're talking about diagnosing somebody with diabetes, yes, that standard range is the reference point you would naturally be drawn to. But if you're talking about someone who's already diagnosed, trying to work self-management, is that really the reference point? Or maybe we would want to have a more explicit presentation of what their reference point is, something like this. So here's a different display in which we've added in a goal range for people with type 2 diabetes to show that the goal for someone who's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes can be different than what the standard range is. Now, having seen my previous study, you might say, well, may, wait a second, maybe we should add in even more kinds of colors. And we did that. Here's an example of this. Right? We took that blocked line that we had before and added that goal design. And it gets pretty darn complicated here, right? There's two things that are green. There's a green thing that's also orange. This looks confusing. Uh, spoiler alert, it is confusing. It doesn't work very well. Um, but it highlights sort of the point, which is that adding more information isn't always helpful here. And in fact, sometimes the most useful thing we can do is to subtract information, to make it simpler so that people can figure out what matters. When you do that here by recognizing that if you're trying to use this for self-management and you've already been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, then maybe the only thing you need to have is that goal range, something that would look like this. So I've shown you these different versions, which we sort of iteratively developed through not just our deliberations, but through discussions with patients with diabetes, and then went forward to test this. And again, I'm just trying to highlight sort of selective results to get you the gist of this. Here's a table that shows for the percentage of people who, show up, who saw displays like the ones I've been showing you, where the value was 6.2%, and ask them, which way do you want to go? Do you want to be going further down? Do you want to be going up? Do you want to be where you are, et cetera? Now, again, I'm not a clinician. I don't want to say that this is medical advice, but I certainly had a number of conversations with clinicians about concerns that patients with type 2 diabetes sometimes feel like they have to pursue extremely tight blood glucose control the point where they actually run risks of hypoglycemic episodes. And somewhat, we may want to be conveying to people that you can take this too far. Now, you may agree with me or disagree with me. That's not the point here. But if we have a standard range, and if we have a goal range that says, we want you to be here, and that goal range has a bottom, I want someone to believe that if they've gone past that bottom, they need to back off. They need to be willing to go back up a little bit. And what we see on this slide is that when there's no goal range, people just feel like they have to go down to the standard range, even though we told them in the scenario that their goal was to be below seven. They dismissed that word. They felt, no, I gotta get down below. When we added that standard range on top of the goal, it gets a little confusing. But when there's only the goal presented, then people realize, or at least a significant number of people sort of feel like, well, wait, wait a second, Maybe I, should, I need to be going up. The point here is not that we've gotten a perfect display for someone with type 2 diabetes. The point is that simplicity matters, that adding information, a standard range on top of a goal range, or maybe, sorry, the other way around, a goal range on top of a standard range doesn't necessarily make it easier for patients to understand what they're supposed to do. It can make it harder. And so if we want to give people a goal that is different than what the standard range is, and it's not my call as to whether we want to do that, but if we want to do that, making the display as simple as possible, showing them what their goal is and that's it, is the way that seems to make it easier for patients to orient to what they're supposed to be doing next. 
You see, as we've gone through this, one of the things that we've realized is that when we started this, I thought that the problem was going to be how the heck do you get people to react really strongly when their values are really bad? Turns out that is not the problem. Almost anything, even the tables, people will figure, if they figure anything out, they figure that the value is really different and they react strongly to that. No, 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 no. The problem is how do we get people to react less? to mildly out-of-range values, things which are often not really clinically concerning, but which may provoke patient anxiety, calls, or even resource utilization. So to pursue that further, we went down another line of development, trying to think about ways of providing additional reference points. And an early version of this was something kind of like the similar, the standard range, um, the simple line that I showed you earlier. Here's, here it is displayed in, with the ALT test result. Again, notice here that we've extended this out a long way past the standard range. And the reason for that is one of the things that the clinicians we've talked to said over and over and over again is, look, ALT can get really big compared to the standard range before you really start to worry about it. As a naive patient, I look at, at an 80 and say, look, that's twice the top of the standard range at 40. I must be dead. Most clinicians don't think that way. And until I see this display, I might be really worried about this. Now I look at this and I go, okay, I'm not normal, but I'm not out, way the heck out there. We can make this better. So one thing that we did was to play with the color gradients. So you'll notice here on this version, we've extended the green that represents the standard range into the range that, that extends upward and faded it away to sort of get the sense that, okay, you're not normal, but you're not really bad either. The last thing I want to show you is this. We came up with this version, and, and this went through several iterative rounds of discussions with patients, in which we gave them another anchor point. In this case, we labeled it, many doctors are not concerned until here. And the idea of this was to show that your value in this case, the 80, it may be to the right of the standard range, but it's to the left of that, what we call a harm anchor point. And that that might help patients to recognize that maybe they don't have to be super worried about that value, even if they want to talk to their doctor about it. So in this study, we compared the same three tests I was talking about previously, platelet count, ALT, and serum creatinine, with either these harm anchors or not. So Forget the blocks, just the simple gray-green designs here. But either we had that extra harm anchor present or not. Similar kind of medic medication management scenario, almost 800 U.S. adults, again, drawn from the same demographically diverse online panel. Again, summarizing the design between subjects, they either got all simple designs or all designs with harm anchors. And they initially saw values that were near to the standard range, and then we repeated this with values that were more extreme. Same design that you've, we've talked about already. From the results standpoint, one thing became really clear, at least for two out of these three displays, harm anchors reduced patient alarm about near values. Now, I want to be clear here. The response scale is not at all alarming to very alarming. Everybody's up in the threes to fours, right? Nobody is not worried about this. But they're less worried when they have the harm anchor there for the ALT and the serum creatinine results than they are with the simple design. But importantly, this manipulation did not change people's reactions to the extreme values. No significant differences here. So graphically, what you see is this pattern, right? Difference for the, in perceptions for the near values, convergence for the extreme values. In other words, patients who were receiving these types of harm anchor displays showed increased sensitivity to what the value is. They weren't just reacting the same way to both values. You'll see a theme here, this idea that when we create more meaningful displays, we can increase sensitivity. And same kind of thing we saw before. Harm anchors reduce respondents' desire to contact their doctor urgently. Now, 
just to wrap this up, I want to sort of make two points. One is to sort of ask the question, I started this talk with the idea of information evaluability and the importance of reference points. So, okay, we need reference points. What do we want patients to be comparing themselves to? Right now, what they get is standard ranges. I've shown you this alternate idea of a harm anchor. And the point here is that what we're comparing is, do we want patients to be comparing themselves to what's normal or to what's dangerous? In a case that may be about diagnosis, where the test is being ordered to figure out whether or not someone has a problem, maybe the standard range is the right reference point. But in a self-management context, a chronic disease context, oftentimes, at least from my perspective, our ultimate goal for what the patient should take away is, am I in trouble? Am I in danger or not? In which case, maybe alternate reference points might be useful. Now, there are some important challenges here. I've talked about the importance of this scale endpoints. I've shown you displays that have particular categories. And I've introduced this idea of harm thresholds or action thresholds. If we're going to have displays that use these kinds of visual cues, somebody's got to make the choice about what those cues are. What defines borderline values? Where to put that threshold? How much of, this, of the range of possible values to show? Those choices have real impact on patient understanding, but somebody's going to have to make those choices. And that's not going to be trivial, and I don't want to minimize that. I also want to be clear that there is some challenges here in terms of acceptance of responsibility, right? If I give you a display that says, most doctors are not worried about this until here, are not concerned about this until here, and your value is under that, but something bad happens, are, how are we going to navigate that situation? And you might say, well, maybe we can't do this. Well, let's not forget that we're right now giving patients tables with values and standard ranges and nothing else and expecting them to respond to them. And we know that they have problems with that. So it's not that there's no responsibility from what we're already doing. Ultimately, the question is, can we make displays that are more meaningful that increase patients' ability to respond appropriately without causing further problems. I believe we can, but it will take effort. Because ultimately, the challenge that we face here is the recognition that as we make patients have more direct access to all kinds of health data, laboratory test results or otherwise, we have to remember that giving patients the right, most accurate number for their health does not in any way guarantee that at the end of the day, they're going to be able to walk away with the right message. So I'm going to put my contact information here. Uh, thank you all for listening. I hope you found this informative and interesting. I'll be happy to take questions once we're done with all of the presentations. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Brian. For those of you with questions, please submit them through the Q&A panel, and we will come back to them at the end of both presentations. Let's move on to our second presentation, which is being led by Dr. Genevieve Melton Mo. Dr. Melton Mo is an associate professor of surgery and core faculty in the Institute for Health Informatics at University of Minnesota. She's a practicing colorectal surgeon and also serves as the chief health information officer for Fairview Health Services and University of Minnesota Physicians, where she leads efforts to strategically optimize the institution's enterprise EHR and other health IT for patient care, data reporting and analytics, and quality. Her research interests include clinical colorectal surgery, improving note usage in EHRs, evaluating standards in practice, clinical natural language processing, and improving surgical care with informatics. She co-leads the University of Minnesota Clinical Natural Language Processing and Information Extraction Research Group and serves nationally on the Clinical Informatics Subspecialty Board Examination Committee of the American Board of Preventive Medicine, the Health IT Research Study Section for AHRQs, Informatics Committee of the American College of Surgeons. And now it is my pleasure to turn the control over to Dr. Melton Mo. 
Thank you all. Um, it's a real privilege to be here today to participate in uh, this webinar. I'm going to switch gears right now, and um, I think this would be a nice segue to start talking about um, from the patient perspective, now turning to the provider or clinician perspective. Um, so I'll just go through the learning objectives up front. Um, we're going to be um, talking a bit about usability testing and its importance uh, with EHR functionality and looking specifically at navigators. And second, hopefully at the end of this, um, we'll gain a better understanding of the impact of how we organize our clinical notes and um, what the impact of uh, section order uh, may play on our experience of reviewing um, patient notes. So I'm going to start with um, high-level background um, to both studies that we'll be discussing uh, during the webinar. Um, as we all know, um, electronic health record systems are um, increasingly used and really ubiquitous to providing um, much of patient uh, care right now. Um, we know that healthcare systems are being expected to leverage electronic health records to provide more reliable and hopefully value-based care. And they're really at the crux of many of the changes that are taking place in our healthcare system. And despite this and their increased use, there is a huge issue right now with user satisfaction with electronic health records. And much of this is likely because of um, quick change over a short period of time in how we practice, but um, one of the main um, issues that's been identified is that um, there's probably poor usability of these systems. And uh, so we wanted to look at this more and put some more focus on uh, human factors, workflow, and usability principles. So the first study that we're going to talk about is around an ambulatory uh, navigator and um, doing user-centered design. It's really a use case around this. Um, and really want to acknowledge the team, the very multidisciplinary team, including uh, Jenna Marquardt, who I wanted to mention, um, an industrial engineer with a uh, high focus on uh, usability testing. And so this um, was a study that we did at our medical center. Um, we had, um, in our ambulatory clinics, we had recently upgraded our commercial electronic health record and we're looking at how we were using our navigators in the ambulatory setting. And the staff had identified um, several issues. Um, what had happened over time is that um, the functionality of our navigator had um, really um, not been looked at as a whole. And we had added functionality over time. So in, over time, uh, we had maybe started with 15 options and had gone up to over 30 in the navigator. Um, the list had gotten very long. It required scrolling. And um, there were several things that weren't really being used. And so we wanted to redesign the navigator um, and do it in a user-centered fashion. And so we wanted to, as a, an extension of redesigning the navigator to understand the usability um, de novo of the original and the optimized navigator. And we did this using a framework of trying to um, complete meaningful use tasks. So this is how we redesigned our navigator. We started with um, initial um, focus group sessions. We had um, both specialty and primary care providers. And we also had a usability um, expert that was an implementation that was part of this um, group. And we identified key tasks by role that were most important to provide ambulatory care. Uh, the clinicians met with the developers um, over um, several weeks, and this was done in a rapid iterative fashion. And um, they kept testing different iterations of the navigator to hopefully get it just right with the different roles. Um, got feedback from other clinician roles. Most of the clinicians that were part of the initial um, development were providers with a couple of nurses, but we got additional nurse manager, nursing assistants, um, and other clinician feedback. And then, uh, again, uh, went to other clinicians and iterated upon this. So we thought we had pretty good buy-in as we designed the navigator. 
So I'll give you a look at our old navigator. Um, <laughs> um, as I was saying, it did scroll down. Um, you could open the navigator by clicking a button called the Visit Navigator. It launched um, when you went into a clinic visit. And um, the default, um, this was again the default as you opened the chart. And there was this long column uh, divided into different domains, uh, the charting part, you can see surgery going down, and you can see some of the sample items uh, looking down. And then there were some additional options if you wanted to look at uh, different parts of the chart to the left, and that was called the activities bar. Um, as we redesigned things, we packaged, packaged it slightly differently and parsed out the different tasks. So this is the new navigator. At a high level, you can see that there are these what we call um, larger buttons or chunky buttons that um, group different tasks. Um, so the intake um, button was really for tasks that the learning staff um, would be using um, and potentially some of the nurses. And then the charting um, button had um, options that were really used primarily by providers. And again, you can see it's slightly different organization with uh, the options being at the top instead of up and down along the side. And there were less options here along the left hand column. And so to look at this a little bit further um, and really just see de novo, how did usability, um, how was the usability of these uh, different navigators? We took a convenience sample. These were um, mid-level to senior residents. And these were experienced users of this uh, type of electronic health record, but really more experienced in the inpatient setting. And they were not familiar with this particular ambulatory navigator. They um, either had their ambulatory experience um, in another system, such as the VA, um, or at a different health care system. And so what we did, our overall protocol at a more detailed level, was that we asked the residents to complete a set of tasks. And these were based off of meaningful use stage two criteria. Um, we had um, them go into different uh, patients and perform different levels of tasks. And you can see some of the tasks down below entering a chief complaint. Um, these are very rote, you know, um, prescribing medication associated with the diagnosis, review of past medical history. And we um, tested these tasks and these cases. Um, to ensure that they were similar level of difficulty and uh, did run this with uh, two separate um, uh, providers prior to administering these um, to the actual uh, study participants. Um, the cases were done in both the original navigator and in the new navigator, and we did do one case which was performed in both navigators. And we randomized the cases in the navigators uh, to test it since it would be difficult to do intra-rater uh, testing for the same case. Um, throughout the case, the participants uh, did a think aloud protocol um, to, to say what, what they were thinking as they performed the task. And afterwards, uh, the participants completed a single use question as well as completed uh, the system usability survey thus, um, for each of the navigators. Finally, um, the participants completed a final survey um, to provide um, additional feedback on the cases, the navigators, and their overall experience. We did um, analysis um, that was both quantitative, including time on task, as well as measurements with the surveys, as well as looked uh, specifically at the navigation pathways, which I'll show you in some depth and also did a qualitative analysis of um, the sessions which were recorded and coded uh, for themes using a thematic uh, analysis. Um, so let me just get straight to some of the results, our major results. Um, so we had, uh, again, five cases. Uh, Maggie is the one that was done first. Um, it was done in both navigators. But at a high level, you can see that for each of the cases, that each took about similar amounts of time um, and have similar perceived workload. Um, overall, even though it wasn't uh, really statistically different, um, 
and again, small numbers, um, the time to complete tasks tended to be a little bit longer in the new navigator. We did find um, that overall participants um, encountered um, problems um, when they um, when they try to do different tasks, and they experienced a bit of confusion. And the preferences between the two navigators have mixed. Uh, again, this, these were naive users. Um, and some of the things that they um, either liked or did not like had to do with um, the organization of the links at the top versus the side, um, and some preferring preferring to have the longer list but having all options versus a shorter list, but sometimes having to look for additional items uh, tended to sometimes be a problem. And in this case, especially because, again, these were naive users, separating the menus for uh, different roles between intakes or those that are rooming the patient versus charting uh, did introduce confusion with the new navigator. This slide um, is busy, but I think one of the more interesting slides in our analysis, um, we did a pathway analysis um, really to show how different tasks were accomplished. Um, and only a subset of the pathways are shown here, but just at a high level, um, the light gray text, um, so maybe starting, if you start at the second column, uh, just to um, orient you, um, are items that were only available um, in the um, other navigator by default. And the second column, again, is, is called the activities. And this shows the available default buttons um, that um, were found, again, in that left column that I showed you before um, with the two navigators. Um, and this first column are the options that were available after one of the um, activity buttons was clicked. So it shows that uh, multiple activities could be could result as um, underneath the activity button. The third column are the options um, after one of the navigation links is clicked. So if you look at the old navigator pathway, um, there was only one way to kind of get into these different items in the visit navigator through that button called visit navigator. Whereas if you go to the new navigator, you can see that there's the intake and the charting um, as the two major ways to get in and the tasks are split between. And then the fourth item are the sub-items that could be available once you go into one of the navigator options. Um, we found actually that this analysis was very helpful and we did some um, quantitative things as well, but just seeing it is helpful in understanding how specific uh, tasks were accomplished. And really, you know, if we go on to the next slide, our pathway analysis really demonstrated that even for really simple tasks that um, electronic health record navigators um, do have um, multiple options. So as a, for instance, um, even for um, simple tasks, we, we saw from two up to five different ways that a particular task could be accomplished. And um, often, participants were using a pathway based off of the first way that they learned it, so based off of preferences that they had developed over time, even when there was something that was, um, uh, would have been um, simpler to perform uh, using the navigator as it had been designed. Um, and there were also options that were available to participants that weren't used at all. And um, sometimes we found that participants would use unanticipated pathways or workarounds and search in different ways to find things. We found that um, the navigation patterns did differ depending upon the navigator. Um, and so um, this was interesting as, for instance, when the left-hand column had less options um, in the new navigator, uh, participants um, de novo found other pathways to do uh, tasks. So. Um, to wrap this up overall for this first study, uh, we found that um, electronic health record navigators are an important use case, and they really do show that um, it, it makes a difference in how users are able to perform tasks, and that uh, navigation pattern 
um, can be influenced by Navigator and, and can affect the overall experience of um, end users. And this really also demonstrates at a high level that there is this tension between providing users additional flexibility um, while at the same time wanting them to um, have a standard way that might be more efficient to do um, a set of work. Uh, we experienced, again, um, we saw that users had um, confusion that was common uh, regardless of which navigator was used. And um, interestingly, although we saw that participants uh, experienced significant struggles um, when completing different tasks. When you ask them at the end, um, how was it, they said, oh, that was easy. Um, and maybe, maybe it, it, it does indicate that users are um, getting used to maybe badly um, some frustration with using, um, with using technology and, and I've just uh, accepted that that's part of what happens. And it does indicate that training um, around workflow and process uh, might be beneficial. So um, the study is limited in several ways. Again, it was a small group. These were only resident physicians. This may or may not extend to other providers, attending physicians, and this was done in a usability lab. And we're starting to, as we look at um, rolling out additional user-centered design uh, functionality, um, doing it more deliberately with a training component, and also trying to validate our findings in a naturalistic setting. So hopefully at the end of this particular study, you can see some of the um, helpfulness of doing the user-centered design, but um, again, taking it with a grain of salt, that it, it doesn't appear to be sufficient, that we really need to incorporate it with the full piece, as you would expect, perhaps, uh, with the workflow and uh, potentially training as well. Um, the other takeaway, again, is that uh, tension between flexibility and standardization and um, training. Uh, with that. So I'm going to go on to a second study that um, is currently in review. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I do mostly, our, our group does a lot of work with clinical notes, particularly uh, with information extraction and, um, and uh, natural language processing. We were very interested as we um, have been looking at notes and seeing what's going on with the electronic health record, the effect of how notes are organized. So in this study, we focused on progress notes. Um, and these are types of notes that are created mostly by providers, uh, meaning mostly physicians and mid-level providers like advanced practice nurses and uh, uh, physician assistants. Um, and, these, and nurses too, to some extent, but um, these are notes that are used to really update um, what a patient's status has um, been from a previous note. Uh, they can be, pr they are um, made usually on a daily basis in the hospital setting and as well in an ambulatory setting if a patient had been seen previously during an ambulatory, uh, previous ambulatory encounter. The notes are typically organized in what we call a SOAP format, subjective, objective assessment and plan. And this was um, an organization that was um, established, or framework that was established by Larry Weed in the 1960s as part of uh, the problem-oriented medical record framework. Now, as opposed to written progress notes, electronic progress notes um, are quite long um, and do um, often contain a lot of extra or, or extraneous information. And we think that a lot of this has to do with the easy um, ability to bring in um, information from different parts of the chart. Um, and there have been some studies that have shown that the assessment and plan section might be um, of high value. And, um, and it's interesting because this tends to be towards the end of the note um, using the um, uh, traditional SOAP format um, where the subjective and objective section um, are typically at the beginning. So, you know, again, it's unclear with these longer notes how to um, best make the most important information and notes uh, available and easy to find. So what we wanted to do, and at a high level, um, the rationale for this study was to um, 
try to understand, because of the challenges that have been reported with progress note usage, uh, to understand also what's been reported um, that the assessment and plan section may be um, more important. Um, some have said maybe we should move the assessment and plan section towards the top. Um, so that's been called an APSO format. So the objective of this study was to gain additional insight into how clinicians read progress notes. Now this study, again, was done in a usability laboratory. Um, we have 23 residents for this study, and um, we had developed an electronic health record system prototype that um, was modeled after the open source CPRS or VISTA system, which is used um, in the VA. Um, and um, with this prototype, um, uh, used uh, screen recording and audio recording software called TERF. And again, we had 23 mid-level residents anywhere from uh, year two to year four. So we designed four um, cases um, that were de-identified um, from previous um, real cases, um, and all identifiers were removed. And these were designed to be realistic and be of similar complexity. Um, we had nine progress notes per case. And uh, the patient cases were presented in the same order. And we took those same nine progress notes and formatted them into four different um, orders. So uh, for a particular case, we would take it and have every note ordered in SOAP format, every note ordered in APSO format, or every note in, in these different formats. And then we had a mixed format where three of the notes were randomly organized as SOAP, three randomly as APSO, and three randomly as SAPO. And we um, randomized the format using a Latin squares design so that all participants would see all four notes formats uh, for the different cases. So just to go into a little more detail around our protocol, we um, had each of the participants um, uh, review the case as they normally would, then they provided a verbal summary of each of the four cases, and then they um, filled out a standard workload instrument, uh, the National uh, TLS workload instrument. After doing all four cases, um, they completed an exit interview as well as an exit questionnaire. And along with that, um, our analysis included um, uh, data on um, time um, associated with each of the um, different cases, a scrolling analysis, as well as information about perceived re note reading patterns, uh, which included interview data as well as questionnaire data. When um, we looked at some of the qualitative information, um, users reported that they often uh, perceived that they started um, reading either the subjective or the assessment and plan sections. So I'll read through um, uh, some of this, but a large number of users reported this. So quote, typically when assessing a patient note for any given specialty, I'll look at the H HPI or history of present illness or initial subjective assessment and then go and jump to the assessment and plan. Here's another one, quote, if I'm looking at a specific clinical note, a lot of the time I'll look for the assessment and plan first and then kind of see how they came to that conclusion by reviewing their history and then other things. Similarly, um, users reported skipping a variety of information in notes, including things like the past medical history, vitals, labs, medications, and quote, towards the end here, generally anything that looked auto-populated. Again, that's uh, the functionality that electronic health records have to bring in information from other parts of the chart. Um, similarly, uh, users express frustration with auto-populated data or note bloat, quote-unquote note bloat, um, these very long notes. Um, quote, 
how they auto-populate different things, like the medications, that sometimes the redundancies in that, they sometimes decrease efficiency, unquote. So again, with perceptions, when users were asked about the importance of different sections, um, they perceived um, objective information as less important overall. And, sorry, the assessment and plan um, was very or somewhat important for providing the information that they needed. Similarly, when asked about other sections, providers reported that um, the most recent um, assessment and plan, uh, perhaps past medical history and the chief complaint uh, may be of higher value. Now, overall, when we asked about different information barriers, um, users self-reported moderate to severe barriers um, from a variety of perspectives, um, pretty much everything here. So things um, such as that the information is not present in notes, having difficulty finding information, having poor display of information and difficult to interpret, too much information in notes, um, information that's not accurate in notes, and, um, and that um, others don't always put the information in a consistent way um, into notes. And so these, again, were severe, large, or moderate barriers. Uh, with those top three colors. And so this shows um, the, the actual overall uh, quantitative data um, from our experiment. So at a high level, we did find that um, when going through cases, the um, average reading time um, was lower or the lowest in the APSO format notes with the assessment and plan up top and that the mixed notes uh, format uh, was the slowest. And when you look at the verbal summary time, the average workload score, and the proportion scrolling was pretty similar for any of the, um, any of the um, uh, different formats. And, you know, interestingly, um, there's a lot of scrolling um, over 50% of the time. And this was significant between APSO and mix on our analysis. So the key experimental findings, again, are that it took, um, there was significant uh, difference in time to review, and OPSO took the least time, Mix took the most time, and really if anything was standardized and the um, organization was um, consistent, that tended to be somewhere in between. Uh, there was no significant difference in time to summarize any of the cases or difference in the workload score. Uh, the soap notes had a, the lowest workload score, but this is not significant in our analysis. So at a high level, our study really points to several, several different um, important ideas. The first is that assessment and plan sections are highly valued, and they, um, that was both by subjective report as well as what we observed uh, when we had the assessment and plan um, put first, um, and, and users tended to go to the assessment and plan first in many cases. Um, second, uh, participants really um, perceive a lot of barriers with using notes right now. Um, there seems to be quite a bit of negative impact around auto-populated data, note bloat, including ignoring quite a bit of data. Um, and it's unclear, um, really, are, are users potentially ignoring things that they need to be seeing, um, but, you know, certainly they, they're reporting that they, they tend to skip uh, quite a bit of the note, and there is a lot of scrolling. And, you know, finally, there's some broader questions. Um, one of the questions is, you know, should notes be reordered in some way? Um, mixed notes formats, uh, which is the current state, because there is a lot of flexibility, tend to be um, sort of what we see. One user might organize different than the next user. Um, and so one of the questions we're asking is, should we try to in some way separate the way that we create notes and allow users to have the flexibility to use the traditional SOAP format or another format, um, but then make it so that when users read notes that they're always organized in the same way. We found that APSO notes were read more quickly, and again, I alluded to this, um, you know, is that because um, 
because they're just paying attention to the assessment and plan and are they ignoring things that might be important? And what are the implications with that? And we do have a follow-up study where we're doing eye tracking analysis to understand exactly what is being paid attention to and what uh, users are, are actually reading. And again, uh, despite this, there um, were no significant differences on what uh, the perceived workload and time to summarize cases in um, these experiments. So I'm going to end now um, and um, thank you all again for the opportunity to participate. And I left my contact information here on the last slide. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Genevieve. And again, thank you to both of our presenters for their very informative presentations. So this concludes the content portion of the webinar. Now we have a few minutes left for questions. You can type them into the Q&A section of the WebEx portal. We may not be able to get to them all, but we will answer them all in writing and send the answers out to all attendees. So Brian, I've got a few questions for you. Um, so the first question is, um, since your data display has uh, a lot of colors in them, so how would you address patients who are colorblind? So this is a really good and important question. Obviously, the particular color scheme that we have showed you here relies upon the what's often referred to as the stoplight color scheme, red, yellow, green. Uh, we actually ran a study specifically to explore colors, perceptions, and different color schemes, um, in part because one of our patient partners had expressed thoughts about when you label something as red, is that indicating this is a particularly risky thing or is there sort of a negative, you're a bad patient connotation to that? Um, I, I, to fully describe this in detail would be going beyond the time we have. I, will, I do wanna make one particular point, which is to note that the displays that I showed you all rely upon redundant cues so that you can put them into grayscale with no color and all of the extra information is still there, right? In the blocks version, you have clearly defined blocks with clearly defined labels right next to each one of them that provide information about how far is this borderline, is this low, et cetera, even if you don't have the colors. Even on the color gradient version, in which the colors are changing continuously, you'll notice that we added in a arrow from the sort of high from here up or low from here down. And that was added in particular because we were concerned that we wanted to make sure that someone who has color perception difficulties would still have a very clear signal as to when they reached a sort of higher risk level. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the, any final design for this has to balance the meaning that people who perceive so the full spectrum of color take from the red, yellow, green associations that we have in our society versus the challenges of making sure the display is understandable, fully understandable to someone with, let's say, a red, green color blindness or blue, yellow, or even just in black and white. And so the design process has to take that into account. Thank you. Um, and the next question for you is um, regarding the scale. So someone was um, interesting to and uh, curious to see whether you have um, thought about flipping the scale. So the optimal, whether it's higher or lower, the value would be on the right-hand side. So in other words, the, the graph or the line is not always putting zero to the far left. So um, what's your perception on that? So this particular research question got an enormous amount of discussion in our research group. We for a variety of reasons, decided not to pursue a study on this particular question because we had competing priorities. I think it's a really interesting idea. It will require people to get used to the idea that what the display shows is, let's just say, left is bad, right is good, even though the numbers will be going upwards for some tests and downwards for other tests. But for a, if you think about the way in which industrial um, 
information displays are designed, they often do things like this to facilitate people scanning down a, a set of displays to find things that are potentially concerning. And it may well be appropriate to think about developing displays that would do exactly that for either patients or clinicians um, to facilitate, again, that sort of quick identification of what are the things that I need to focus on and which direction do I need to go. Now, I, I want to highlight that last piece because if we do that flip so that, for example, to the right is lower numbers because that's worse, you then have to worry about the question is, will the user walk away knowing which direction their value should be going? And if you have confusion with that because you flip the scale, that actually might undermine the benefits of the display. Thank you. Um, and the next question is about display data um, longitudinally or with trend, because a lot of the test results are built upon or follow up from previous lab tests. Um, have you done anything with display longitudinal data? Yes. We just did, I didn't include it in this presentation, but yes, we've run a study that particularly looked at the issues involved with presenting past data. Do you only want to present one past result? Do you only want to present many past results? There are multiple different graphical displays that can be used to present multiple sort of past results. But again, you run into the simplicity versus complexity problem. Um, if it's a nice monotonic trend, it's relatively easy to develop displays that make sense. But in the real world, oftentimes values bounce around, and figuring out how to design a display that is simple and easy to understand, yet nonetheless provides that historical data context and trend information is not trivial. But yes, we've been working on it, just haven't presented that here. No, good to know. <laughs> and have you tested this data display with physicians in addition to patients? So the physician context is, um, Interesting for two reasons. One is the question of how do physicians respond to these displays for their own use? And the second is how do physicians respond to the idea of patients having these types of displays? Um, we've actually focused more on the second of those questions. So I have data from a survey of physicians in which we showed them the displays that I showed here and explored their perceptions of which ones they would prefer for giving patients and to what degree they have concerns about those displays, and I mentioned some of those issues at the end of my, of my talk. Um, I also think that there's an interesting application of these types of displays or other variants of them for um, physician-focused electronic record system displays, um, but it's not immediately obvious to me that the same characteristics that a patient display has are the optimal designs for physicians, right? We, we can use physicians' experience and training so that we don't always have to present exactly the same thing that we would present to a naive patient uh, who doesn't have experience with these test results. But the basic idea of placing a value on a potential visual range has been incorporated in a lot of, of dashboard systems for a variety of clinical data, and I would love to see it done more often. Okay, great. And, um, and the next question is, have you tested um, doing other more interactive model with patients um, so they could um, interact with the data through either hovering over the, um, the line through with more detail or have a drill down menu or and other? So have you tracked or test their interactions? So I love the fact these questions are like running down the list of conversations our research group has had. We, we have not yet done major studies in this grant exploring interactivity. Um, I have done a series of research studies looking at interactivity in a related but different context, which is health risk communication. Um, and the results of that work has been mixed. Um, one of the things that we discovered when exploring interactivity and risk communication is that the more that patients are focused on figuring out what they're supposed to do or what they can do in the interactivity, that distracts from their processing of the basic visual image, and it can inhibit their ability to take away information from that visual image to the point where we've at least published one paper in which we found it actually made it worse than just giving people a static graphic. Um, 
I have mixed feelings about this kind of context. I do think that there's some potential value for interactivity, especially as it connects back to the idea of historical data and trends so that people can potentially see time unfold over by, by turning things on or off or, or animation, et cetera. But I'm very concerned about the potential that things that will look cool um, and capture people's attention may in fact distract from their processing of the meaning of their particular test value. Um, and so figuring out what the right balance of that is not going to be easy. Okay, thank you. So um, Genevieve, I also got a few questions for you. Um, so have you thought about an option for data to be accessed through an API by various data board apps so practitioners and patients can select the app or tool that um, best meets their needs? Um, and that's, um, you noted that there's a divergence in how people interact with data. And maybe Brian can also answer this one. As well. Um, so I, I think at a, this is Genevieve, but at a broad level, I think that that's um, a, conceptually a, a great idea. Um, I think that um, one of the issues would be, so I, I think if, if we're talking about a very um, quote unquote straightforward task, um, that um, is likely a, a great approach. I think it, it does get a little bit more complex when um, we're talking about trying to, um, let's say, during an ambulatory visit, understand um, multiple facets of things about a patient. And sometimes during that visit, you might need more information than you anticipated. Um, and so you may have to go uh, to other parts of the electronic health record. So. Um, but, but the idea of being able to um, uh, pull what's needed and be able to present it in different ways and give freedom to users to see and interact with uh, the patient chart in a different way is, is definitely um, a, a great idea and a valuable thing. And I think that that, um, that may bring um, some nice innovation towards how we are able to uh, uh, provide care. Brian, do you have anything to add? Not really. I mean, I think a broad point, which is um, whether we're talking about displays or we're talking about navigation, um, aligning the steps or the displays, et cetera, to the user's purpose is where the ballgame is at. And, and what the sort of distinction that Genevieve brought up in terms of um, Maybe you want one thing for fairly straightforward situations, and maybe you need something different when it gets complicated is, is a pattern we see over and over again. Um, I think the danger is in that we, in our de desire to make things easier for ourselves, we believe that there can be one-size-fits-all answers, and the w common problem is that one-size-fits-all doesn't actually fit all. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Genevieve, um, the next question is, um, have you considered voice interaction for the navigators? So, I think that, um, so, so we have not done that, but there are definitely some prototypes out there um, uh, where voice navigation is, is being used. Um, and certainly, um, if um, sections of the note um, are easily identified that that could be a way to avoid scrolling. So that, that is a possible solution. Okay, thank you. Um, and the visualizations that you presented would require significant development by an EHR um, company that, or companies that, that are not uh, ready in the SAS model. Can you estimate this cost and the willingness of vendors to take this path? So uh, I think two different questions. Um, vendors are, in some ways, depending upon where they are in the market, are more or less excited. Um, definitely the ones that have um, a good market share are less excited to go to this type of um, model. 
um, I think with some of the work that's happening at a national level around certified health information technology, um, vendors are going to be pushed towards this model. Um, okay. And I and I think you know according to where the vendor is in the market, they're more or less willing to um, accommodate that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, um, so the next question is uh, for Brian. So the goal of getting patients to react less to mildly out of range values appears to be framed um, primarily from the provider's perspective. Um, it responds to their need to avoid unnecessary calls. So how would you reframe this from the patient's perspective? Well, in some sense, the easiest answer to that is to go back to the story I told at the beginning of the presentation, right? I was worried, and I was worried about a value that when my doctor actually discussed it with me, she, what she really meant was it's not that there's no point at which I'm going to worry about your bilirubin, but we haven't gotten there yet. And I don't remember what she said, whether she said, you know, don't worry until we get to two or three or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, is that I had the experience of being anxious about a value where all I needed was one little bit of extra information and I wouldn't have had that negative experience. And, and that's not an uncommon story, um, that patients, especially those who are particularly worried about their condition, seize upon whatever information are provided by their doctors or through the patient portal. And if the values make them worry about stuff that they then discover they didn't need to be worrying about, that's unnecessary harm. And I'm using the word harm intentionally. Um, and we can and should try to prevent that harm. Um, obviously, that also has benefits to the healthcare system. Um, but I really look at it primarily from the patient standpoint. I, I want to know when I need to worry, and I want, need to, I want to know when I don't. And I really value when I'm given information that enables me to feel a sense of confidence that I don't need to worry right now. Okay. Thank you. So um, we have reached the end of our time for this webinar. Thank you all for attending. For those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL shown on this slide. You will select, you will select today's webinar, which will be indicated by date and title, and then complete a brief evaluation of the event to claim your credit. You will have until July 15th to claim your credit for participating in this webinar. Upon exiting today's webinar, AHRQ is also building a brief evaluation, and we hope that you will complete this survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you all very much for participating in this webinar today, and we hope you will join us for future learning opportunities.